Freddie. Thanks a lot. Standing by from the Artesia Historical Museum and Art Center is Michael Redman. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Sorry we're a couple minutes late, but uh, we'll get right into your content. You've got a, a big uh, kind of an annual event display that you're getting ready to unveil for folks, and I'm sure you want to talk about that. Um, is that where you'd like to start, or did you have something else you'd like to, to dig into today? Well, something else, because I, I think uh, instead of talking about the Veterans uh, Day honoring Artesia Veterans exhibit, I, I'd rather that people actually come in and see it. Sure. I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> okay, that's um, fine. So instead, uh, let's talk about uh, Civil War artillery. Okay. So they, they had, that's uh, Veterans uh, Day related, it's military. And, uh, of course, uh, with there being Civil War battles in New Mexico, they had artillery. So let, let's talk about how artillery worked in the 1860s. Okay. They, of course, uh, were large uh, weapons used to fire solid, uh, solid shot and exploding shell across long distances. Uh, in 1861, out here in New Mexico, at the forts, they had uh, what was considered some of the older, um, not necessarily up-to-date artillery pieces. They kind of sent the old stuff out here and kept all the new stuff and the larger stuff along the uh, east coast and the west coast. Okay. So out here at the forts, uh, particularly at uh, Fort Craig, uh, which is where the uh, the U.S. Army was uh, assembling prior to the Battle of Valverde. They had six-pound field guns, 12-pound howitzers, uh, one 20, or two 24-pound howitzers, and one 12-pound mountain howitzer. So what does that mean? The field guns uh, in the uh, 1860s well, 1860s was a was a, a time when they were replacing old style smooth board uh, bronze guns with uh, iron rifled cannons. So the six pounders that they had out here, they were small bronze smooth bore cannons. The 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 bores were completely smooth, uh, made out of bronze, mm -hmm. uh, a softer metal that fired six-pound uh, solid shot. Okay. Now, solid shot was one type of ammunition that they could fire. They had solid shot. They had case shot. They, had, uh, they also had uh, spherical shells. Spherical case... Uh, here's where the terminology gets interesting. Mm -hmm. Case shot is also shrapnel shell. They use a couple different terms for it, which gets confusing when you read uh, when you read uh, historical accounts. You see case shots, and then you see canister, and then you see grape shots. And what's the difference between all of them? Right. And this is, all comes about because in the uh, prior to the 1860s, the idea was that a cannon would fire a solid shot, or it could fire a cluster of small shots, small balls. These are all rounds, by the way. Or it could fire. They, they came up with a way to safely fire a round spherical shot, uh, shots that were hollowed out and filled with uh, gunpowder. Or they would be filled with gunpowder and a mix of uh, small uh, little uh, lead balls. But sometimes they had can tin cans that were filled with metal balls. So it's all, it all gets a little confusing unless you actually see what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. So a canister, of course, is a tin can that has no explosives in it whatsoever, so it basically turns a cannon into a large shotgun. Case shot, or shrapnel shell, named after a, an English uh, guy who invented shrapnel, fires, it explodes, and then it fires all those little lead balls in all directions, unlike a canister, which fires in one direction. So that's what they had out here. They had uh, 
couple of the old-fashioned uh, six-pound uh, uh, field guns out here, because back east they were using 12-pound field guns, which were also outdated, and by 1861 they were mass-producing rifled uh, iron uh, field guns that fired a 10-pound shells, or they were all standardized at uh, three-inch uh, diameter size. So out here is the is the old-fashioned uh, bronze stuff. But they also had howitzers, mm-hmm. which nowadays they have howitzers, but back then howitzers were considered uh, outdated as well. Because in the 1860s, uh, the field guns were capable of firing explosive shells. Prior to that, in the 1840s, when they had these uh, various uh, systems, these are all 1840s model uh, artillery pieces, by the way. Mm -hmm. So the uh, howitzers in the 1840s, they would fire exploding shells. They would not fire solid shot. And the field guns would fire solid shot and were not intended to fire shells, although they did make shells by the Civil War for them. And it's interesting to think, and the reason for that the uh, the amount of powder that they'd use for for firing these shells, uh, the six pounders would use uh, two pounds of uh, gunpowder to fire off their shells, and that meant that they would go long distances uh, in straight uh, trajectories before crashing to the ground. Howitzers would use half pounds of powder. Hmm. A lot so less the idea was powder, that, but they could push a bigger shell yeah yeah because they would kind of it would push it up and outwards and then it would drop down pretty quickly well let me let me ask you this because when you say artillery civil war artillery i think of something with wheels on it with is there a difference between a cannon and a field gun or are they similar um oh they're the same thing they're the same thing okay yeah it's just that people use a lot of different words to describe the same exact thing in part two is that uh, civilians uh, over the over the centuries would use different terms than what they would use back then. So, like, for example, all the people standing around the field pieces were cannoneers. There was mm. one gunner. And that gunner, so for, I'm assuming, ran the crew or ran the, 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 the cannoneers that were loading and operating the weapon. Uh, precisely. The, the, the gunner was the person who was giving out the commands, but he was also the person who was uh, actually aiming the piece okay. to where it needed to go. And he would have up to seven people doing this uh, sort of uh, ballet around him, everybody having their one set thing they'd do, and they would, uh, everything would just move uh, smoothly, like mm-hmm. clockwork. Well, let me ask you this. You said shrapnel was named after someone. Howitzer, was that also a name... Uh, was there a person named Howitzer that invented this type of uh, field gun? Oh, goodness. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Yeah. I know Howitzer has been used since the... Uh, For a long time. Yeah, since the 1500s, I think. Yeah. So that will be it's something really old. to look up uh, at, a, at a later time. But whenever I hear of Howitzer, I figure, well, that had to be named after somebody named Howitzer who came up with this <laughs> With this type of gun, and then everybody, you know, started utilizing it in their in their uh, weapons. But uh, we'll, we'll look that up for another for another day. So we had uh, field guns and howitzers in New Mexico um, prior to uh, to the Civil War. Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the the fancier pieces, uh, the more modern pieces, did not appear until the uh, end of the war. But out here, and in fact, they didn't even have artillery uh, units out here. Like for example, these field guns that were uh, and howitzers that were used at the Battle of Al Verde, they were used by uh, uh, cavalry soldiers assigned to the artillery. Uh, same for Glorietta. Okay. They uh, before the war the. Uh, cavalry and the infantry would be trained to use this stuff. Uh, they would be trained to, to do multiple things. So that way, if they ever needed to use a, uh, a howitzer or, or a field piece in battle, they 
will just uh, you know set aside their their muskets and then use the howitzers. Mm-hmm. And so they had they had them in storage uh, at Fort Craig, Fort Union, and other places. What's interesting is that uh, when the, when the Texans invaded, they brought with six uh, uh, mountain howitzers and uh, two uh, uh, six pound field guns. And that's what uh, I think I missed your question. No, no, I, I no, I was just uh, I was taking in what you were what you were talking about, and I guess the difference between the the howitzer and the field guns would be in the in the range that they had, or the type of target that they were used for. Uh, both uh, the howitzer would be used for uh, for hitting. Uh, uh, often would be used for 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 clearing out areas. Uh, the, the the doctrine of artillery in the era was to uh, place a an artillery piece in a spot and that would uh, basically prevent anybody from moving into that spot without risk of being shot by the cannon or okay. by the howitzer. Okay. It was area of denial. And then a secondary function was to use uh, solid shots or exploding shell against other artillery pieces or against uh, field fortifications. And so uh, during the Battle of uh, Glorieta, the, uh, the United States had uh, two six-pound field guns that they brought over from Fort Union, and they actually managed to disable a uh, Texas uh, six-pound field gun by hitting the barrel with a solid shot. <laughs> That's a lucky they shot. They the barrel. <laughs> oh, it was, it was lucky, but it was also good aim because that was intentional. Right. He tried to hit the other, the other side's uh, artillery pieces with solid shots. If you could hit a wheel, you take out a wheel and be out of action until they can bring in a spare. But if you hit the barrel, it's out of action until they can fix it, and who knows when they can bring it to an arsenal to get it fixed. Right. They'd probably just have to. They'd have to melt down the barrel and recast it. Right. Right. So that was the goal of the different opposing artillery pieces. Uh, taking each other out, I guess. And uh, when these howitzers were used against the uh, Native Americans, they would uh, try to fire them into large clusters to scatter them to break them up. And they would uh, be, uh, of course, uh, dismayed at the uh, exploding shell, and they would they would uh, withdraw. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the goal against uh, when the... Uh, when the United States uh, was fighting against the Confederacy, they would try to blow each other up, but they were a little more uh, bloody-minded, I suppose, because when you look at casualties from fights between the uh, United States and Native Americans, neither side really had large body counts, but when you look at Gettysburg, it's tens of thousands of people dying in just uh, three days. Right, right. So they're willing to just stand there and be blown up. It's a uh, it's a whole other a whole other battle tactics at these different battles. I'm sure is is uh, quite an area to study. Uh, you mentioned artillery tactics uh, in, at that particular time, late uh, eighteen or in the 1860s. Um, was there some army or some group that was maybe credited initially with coming up with the type of artillery tactics that were used at that time? It's Pretty much standard tactics throughout all of uh, all of Europe and the United States and Asia at the time. It's there was something though that uh, the United States used uh, in the previous war against Mexico that they weren't able to use uh, in the Civil War. The idea of the flying artillery, where the everybody would be on horse or riding the caissons and they'd quickly ride in front of the. Uh, in front of your own army, set up the cannons, quickly fire a uh, canister at the enemy to scare them away, which was effective when everybody was using smooth bores in the Mexican War of 1846. But in 1861, everybody was mostly using rifles. Mm -hmm. And with rifles, you can easily hit the gunners at canister range. Sure. So that tactic kind of disappeared. Disappeared as, as the weaponry uh, advanced. 
Michael, we've got about 30 seconds left. Um, I'm sure you'd like to invite people after the Veterans Day program tomorrow to come see the debut of the Honoring Our Veterans exhibit. Yes, the Honoring Artesia's Veterans exhibit will be opening uh, tomorrow and will run until December 31st. It is the uh, is an exhibit that showcases veterans from Artesia, and if you have a relative who is not